comes to you every Saturday morning from this corner of Chicago, uh, 9 to 10 a.m. on WLUW 88.7 <laughs> FM, Chicago Sound Alliance. There's actually a, something going on today over there at the uh, communications building about the future of radio. Uh, so um, I think that's at 5 o'clock this afternoon, the future of radio piece that Danielle and all are taking part in. Uh, I'm not sure. I know there's a WLUW reunion going on. Yeah. Uh, um, and Katie, let me ask you a question. Are you going out to Iowa? Well, I'm going out to Iowa via telephone line all oh, day okay. today and all day tomorrow because of the big rain that's supposed to be happening between us and Iowa. Um, oh, I didn't know about the big rain. Yeah, there's a big rain happening uh, all, all weekend long. I'll check the temperature and it's, in Dubuque. <laughs> it's better to canvas by phone than by foot when it's uh, pouring well, rain. Well, out. I got to say that uh, I'm sure that on all sides of the political spectrum there are people who are making calls around the country, but I have seen in our community here in the 49th Ward in Chicago in Rogers Park, you know, tens upon tens of like, uh, people every night over there at the uh, Democratic Party headquarters making phone calls and then uh, sometimes they actually meet here at the Heartland and they make phone calls and uh, having done a little of this myself it's quite an interesting experience calling people cold uh, it seems to be a lot of old people. They live long out there in Iowa. Um, <laughs> I, I was calling 80 and 90 year olds the other night from here too. I think the list is a little skewed actually. Uh, truly, I mean they're the trick with, uh, even though the technology today of campaigns is amazing, really amazing, um, kids have cell phones. And unless you get into a, a very expensive program of uh, really um, random numbers thing that they do for moneyed interests and polling, uh, you don't get a lot of the cell phones on those printed out sheets that we call from. So it's it is interesting, and I do call. I talk to people and say, "So you want to go to Iowa next weekend?" She goes, "Honey, I just had a hip replacement. I'm uh, I'm giving <laughs> money and uh, I'm telling everybody to vote." And I'm like, no, "Mama, Mama, just rest. We'll get the vote out." Well, for all those people who are boarding buses this morning over there at Estes and Greenleaf, uh, no, excuse me, it's Greenleaf and Ravenswood, and going out to Iowa. I hope the big rain doesn't hit you too hard and you have a good time knocking on doors out there in Dubuque. And um, we, uh, there's a couple more announcements I'm going to throw in, but I think I'll save them and we'll intersperse them while we're talking to our next guest. He's an old comrade brother of mine, uh, Chris Burke. I remember, Chris, when you first showed up from Champaign-Urbana. I'm sure you'd been in Chicago before. <laughs> but uh, you had been involved with a, a printing operation down there. Um, and then you came up here and along with a few other people started Salcedo Press. So I'm going to grill you on the history and then we'll talk a lot about these beautiful posters in your 40-year retrospective that adorns the walls here at the Heartland. So good morning to you. Good Get morning. close to that mic. Good Father, morning. How are you? We're good. Good. <laughs> uh, you know, how does it feel? Uh, it's a little rainy here this morning and I know last week you were out in... Um, you were out into uh, was in at, Michigan or somewhere. I was camping in Door County. I Door was, County. Yeah, really? yeah, I was a little... It was cold. It was brisk. And but, it, um, well, was it beautiful? It was beautiful. The uh, hypothermia was a little... <laughs> kind of <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, it was, it's beautiful. No, but nobody else joined me, but, um, you know... You were by yourself? Yeah, I was by myself. It's a stunning time of year, though, up there. God, you are just as weird as me, Chris. But, well, <laughs> I, I mean, also I like being alone, by don't myself. get me wrong, but I, I would have gotten a, a nice a motel with a, uh, some aqua therapy and then yeah. gone for a walk in the, in the changing colors. Yeah. yeah, it makes you appreciate a hot shower, you know, when you get back and, you know, <laughs> bad, bad, basic things like that. Well, let's... Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask. Michael uh, brought, brought us back to Champagne Days, and I know you guys knew each other before I knew you, but I've, I've known you not that... Much short of a, of a time. Right. I met you through wow. Michael when we started this joint. You knew him since 75. Exactly. 76. So, so, um, I know him since 69. So when did you and Michael meet, and uh, what were you guys up to at the time? Um, I want all the details. I think Michael came down in maybe October of 69, I believe, for um, the... Was it American Revolution 2, the movie was showing? Or the, uh, American Revolution 2, the movie about the young patriots was showing. And Michael brought a couple of the Uptown brothers down with him. 
and uh, and that's where I met him. And uh, we were already working with uh, it was SDS, an, a project of SDS. Which there was, was there was a guy named Vic Berkey. Yeah, Vic. Uh, he was actually kind of started uh, the print co-op, which uh -huh. uh, later became Salcedo Press. You know, four years later. Were Were you guys all students at U of C U, U of I Champaign? Yeah, Vic was a graduate assistant or something like that, a TA. How um, many of you dropped out? Um, let's see, I did. Um, <laughs> still four hours short. Um, my, my philosophy degree. Um, yeah, um, but um, it was a project of SDS. We actually had a newspaper, uh, underground newspaper, called The Walrus. And the local printer was in uh, uh, Rantoul, Illinois, which was a Chinook Air Force base. And oh, was, I remember going through there on the train. Yeah, it was like, you know, really the uh, Mason-Dixon line back then started south of Kankakee somewhere. And um, so the guy started actually, he, he, he looked at it weirdly and said, okay, I'll do this. And then we started getting it back and he cut out pictures of, you know, <laughs> naked people. If we had an obscenity about Nixon, he cut that out too. So we'd pick up the paper and it would have blank spaces literally in the pages, and this obviously wasn't going to work. <laughs> um, so it, it was a, a matter of uh, unrestricted media access is the best way to put it. It's hard to explain now because back then there was no, you know, people couldn't afford Xerox machines, uh, there were no instant imaging, um, you know, radio was out of the question. Um, so really, uh, all, unless you had a mimeograph machine, that was kind of the people's, you know, means of communication. Yeah, and a Gestetner. Did you uh, run one of those as a kid working as a volunteer in your grade school or high school? No, I did um, I did that some purple paper. Did some silk, sc silk screening in Boy Scouts and uh, and then I did actually, I had a summer job at Stuart Warner and I actually ran a little duplicator. So I was actually one of the few people who had run a press before. But um, So anyway, we, we decided we had to set this up and um, you know, it's kind of the old Freedom of the press belongs to those who own one, um, you know, and it, so it's played out. It's, there was a need for it. I still feel there is. It's not as critical now. Um, you know, something like the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. was very important that it just be reproduced, and the easiest way to do that was by print. Um, and, you know, something like that could never be kept under the lid n not anymore. You know, if something gets out, it's out. Um, but uh, there's still a place for print, and... Uh, you know, it's a lot of fun to do this. Uh, looking at this stuff is kind of fun because it's, these are the nice pieces. I mean, a lot of it's just informational day-to-day -day stuff. And, but this is a lot, you know, this, these things are, you know, there's great artists, there's great causes, great fights going on. Chris, you're, you're humble. We are surrounded, people, on all three walls of the Heartland Dining Room by some of the more stirring images and beautiful, artistically done uh, work uh, some of it is silk screen. I'm presuming we're still looking at previous work. No, there's no silk screen. Wasn't here. it originally silk screen? Any no. of these designs? No. Okay. No, this is all for the press. Okay, but okay, sorry, but uh, the the messages and I mean people have been sitting ar uh, sitting under these posters now for about a week since you put it up, and um, they're being educated. They're they're I mean you've got. Uh, Pete Seeger and Jane Sapp up there. You've got uh, the politicization of education uh, in Espanol. You've got, I mean, some of these are just really, really important to look at and remind us uh, from whence we came. I mean, do you feel that sometimes, Chris? Well, let, let, let's, before we get back to going through these posters, let's, I want to get a little more background on Salcedo Press. Because, okay. um, uh, you know, it's there's a sign, one of the posters up here has uh, your printing and it uh, talks about Salcedo and talks about it as the people's printers. And uh, you know, it was a very valuable thing that Newsweb did at uh, one time, printing the Black Panther paper, Rising Up Angry. You didn't ever do uh, newspapers so much as, as uh, propaganda or informational pieces, posters, pamphlets, flyers, those kind of things. Uh, but to get to that place, Tell us a little bit about the the story of uh, bringing Salcedo Press from Champaign-Urbana up here to Chicago. Well, by 1972, the student movement had kind of played out. Um, the main thing there was, you know, the end of the draft, um, or, or at least the, the democratization of it, when um, the lottery came about, and, and, then, and then the war had been, was being Vietnamized. So it really, the, there were fewer and fewer students going. 
And uh, as a result, um, you know, the political activity, you know, people acting in their self-interest, they were not out in the streets very much anymore about anything. And it seemed like in terms of we wanted to get into the political fray, or keep it, stay in it, uh, in the movement, and uh, which was still, you know, going strong. And so it made sense to move to Chicago, um, and just a wider, you know, wider canvas. Um, you know, I knew Michael, Rising Up Angry, um, a lot of other people, you know, in the socialist organizations that existed when we were a lot stronger then. How, how many people were actually involved in the co-op when you started it? Um, there was like probably four of us, me, David, Doug, and Casey in the beginning and then it there was kind of a support group which was probably another half a dozen people some of whom were just even uh, you know kicked out part of their salary some of them were teachers some of the better paid people and where were you uh, located uh, Milwaukee and Polina um, oh, all right the Montauk building the you know, seventh floor of this abandoned uh, it, was a, it was a really dark neighborhood then the tower building was dark at North and Damon it was just it emptied out at night have to lock your battery in, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, now it would be hard to find a space that you could yeah. afford. Yeah. Well, you then moved over on um, near Lake Street and Ashland, or was it? Yeah, the west side. That was, uh, that was 20 years. Um, and so that was another kind of desirable neighborhood uh, because it was right near the Henry Horner, Horner Homes. Um, and again, it was, but it was cheap. It was like a dollar a square foot a year. So, uh, and we had, you know, a, a big place. And um, well, speaking of a big place, one of the things that uh, I think all of us who who know about Salcedo remember is that you would have these May Day parties, and you actually had uh, sometimes you would have them in the middle of the year. You'd have parties. You had a lot of parties there, and people would pay a fee, and there would be a keg or two or three or ten, and there would be some food, and it would be it was a coming together of uh, not only progressive whites but Latinos and African Americans there was just a lot of people on the scene it was uh, it was they were great can you share a little bit about those ongoing parties you had or do you remember yeah <laughs> yeah it uh, they actually I think the first one began as a celebration of the um, the end of the Vietnam War in May of uh, 75 and uh, we just everybody wanted to have a party and I kind of volunteered our place and uh, it came off well and we said hey this is kind of a lot of fun we can just kind of get really loud here doesn't matter if we spill things on the floor and uh, it's fun to party in a factory um, and so we actually uh, just after that and that, that had happened at what it was May 5th or something anyway we decided to kind of just Everybody has that kind of hormonal thing going on at the beginning of a late April, beginning of May anyway. And, you know, it's just kind of a mating season, and the, the left needed one too. Um, and so it, it, we, kind of, we kind of made it the May Day Blast. That, and it, we had like 35 of them in a row until we got too old to do it. We used to start, we used to wind up in Maxwell Street, like having pork chop sandwiches at about 6 in the morning, you know, kind of just all the way through. But they were too old for that now. I remember one notable uh, Salcedo press party I came to. Oh, you and... Me and a congressman. <laughs> and, and... Ed Asner and was Ed riding Asner. around in my yeah. mom's old car. Yeah, in, no, in my mom's old car. But anyway, uh, we were... Uh, we, were we had come from the Norman Cousins, the Deb uh, Thomas dinner. Straight and Norman uh, Thomas, not yeah. Norman Cousins. And no, there was a there were two names, right? I know Norman. Okay, Norman Thomas dinner, which was also yeah, on May Eugene Day. Eugene Debs. And uh, yeah, that was it. <laughs> and uh, both Lane Evans, the congressman, and Ed Asner were honored at that dinner. And uh, it was over at a normal hour that things end, which is about when the Salcedo Press party yes. got started. And I just quietly offered to to bring them over to that Salcedo Press party and. Uh, and over we went, where we parked Ed Asner on a bar stool, put a beer in his hand, and he held forth for the remainder of the evening. Uh, you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show, brought to you every Saturday morning on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. We're talking with our old pal Chris Burke, and we are talking to him today because he has a wonderful exhibit of 40 years of posters that Salcedo Press has put up. Uh, there will be a reception tomorrow from 3 to 6, and then there will be a closing reception which will take place on November 12th. It's a Monday. We'll probably do it before then, maybe uh, Friday on the 12th, 11th, 10th, 9th. Uh, Chris, I, I had a, a question pop into my mind. Uh, in reading about abolitionist history, uh, there are always 
people who, you know, I'm sure there were printers on both sides of the fence historically. You mentioned the guy down in uh, Rantoul or wherever that was, uh, wouldn't print the pictures in your, in your, the walrus out of U University of Illinois, Champaign. Uh, but we had, uh, we had printers here in Illinois who actually had their print shops burned. And actually, uh, many people suffered physical uh, abuse. Uh, probably some people were lynched and hung for the things that they printed. How were, tell us a little bit about your inspirations for becoming a printer and who historically maybe stands out in your mind. Um, you know, I, I only became aware of the, um, that abolitionist printer. I think he was, in fact, killed um, you know, somewhere uh, south of Moline or something on the, on the Illinois River. Or, um, uh, but, um, you know, we, we didn't really, it just kind of fell together, to be honest. We didn't really see a model out there doing it the way we wanted to do it. Um, it naturally became a co-op because we didn't really have a boss, or, and we weren't, we weren't really getting paid for the most part anyway. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of, these, these forms fell together. We eventually realized we had to be a business if we were going to survive long term. And the co-op form fit that best. So it was like really, a, a, it was not so much modeling anything or planning, it's just kind of we adapted the forms to whatever fit the necessities of the time. Well, we're so glad that uh, Salcedo Press showed up because I don't know what would have happened. There used to be a fellow named Joel who was up there in Michigan oh, and yeah. he used to have Red Star Press. Uh, I'm sure there were other small print shops around. They're still around the country. Uh, what's happening with the Syracuse workers? Are they still printing up there in New York State? Um, no, not really. I think they were mainly, after a number of years, they kind of just became a you know poster selling selling posters and.